what's the difference between a macaron, a macaroon, and macron? <laughs> Bonjour, this is Fabulously Delicious, the podcast that's all about delicious French food and the people that love it, cook it, produce it, talk, write, and photograph it. I'm Andrew Pryor. My motto in life is whatever you do, you should do it fabulously. And my guests each week certainly do that. Today, it's all about macarons. Macarons, as some people like to call them the French macaroon, are a sweet treat that tempt me any time I come across them. Funnily enough, they're often made using an Italian meringue as opposed to a French one. This is because there's better structure apparently in an Italian meringue, or possibly because the macaron came to France through the Italian chef of Queen Catherine Medici during the Renaissance period. To delve further into the subject of macarons, I'm joined today by the wonderful pastry chef who I like to call the princess of pastry, Molly Wilkinson. Welcome to Fabulously Delicious and thank you for being my first guest. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. I'm super excited to be here. Oh, I can't wait to dive right into macarons oh, wow. or macaroons or macaron. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that leads me to my first question, actually. What's the difference between a macaron, a macaroon and macron? Okay, so I will admit I do say macaroon quite a lot because I'm American. And macaroon spelled with two O's are actually the coconut concoction. All right, so it's the pile of coconut and it's usually dipped in chocolate. They're super delicious, but very different from the French macaron, okay, spelled with one O. Um, that is what is super popular today with the two cookies that sandwich together a really delicious filling. And then Macron is the French president. <laughs> so also very different. Molly, your career didn't start in baking, actually, did it? You started in digital marketing. I did. So I um, did the very traditional path. Uh, went to college at TCU, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm originally from Dallas. And um, after that, I uh, started working in marketing, so digital marketing, and I did it for seven years. I absolutely loved it. Um, it was <laughs> very different from what I'm doing now. Um, but yeah, I decided to follow my passion in 2013 and uh, moved to Paris and study pastry. So yes, you studied Le Cordon Bleu, my alumni as well. What did you do? Did you do the full diploma there? I did. Um, so I did the pastry certification. Right. Okay. So that's nine months? It's a Yeah. So it's a nine month program. And then after that, I did a three month stage. So an internship at a very little bakery in the 10th arrondissement in Paris. Um, I had the opportunity to go and work for really big name places like Pierre Hermé, but I decided to actually go to this super small pastry shop run by two women um, so I could learn everything that they did uh, start to finish and really learn the process of running a pastry shop as well. Because um, a lot of people wonder, like, how do you get you know, so many different pastries into the vitrine, like the, um, oh my gosh, what's the English word for it? <laughs> the case. Um, every morning. How is that possible? How are they fresh? And so it was really amazing to see the actual um, background of that and um, see how they do uh, the production every day. And um, I learned a lot. I learned so much. So were you getting up like at 3 a.m. to be in the pastry shop at 4? Or? No, I have had jobs like that. But no, for this one, for my internship, I was very lucky. So, you know, like I said, it was two women, right? They got to decide their hours and they were not early birds. So they would arrive around 9 o'clock. We would open the pastry shop around 10, 10.30, kind of whenever everything was done. Um, and that worked out well because people usually they don't shop for pastries super early in the morning right they're usually picking them up maybe before lunch for you know having after their meals and um, we closed up shop around six o'clock every day and often their friends from the neighborhood would come over and have you know a glass of wine we'd do aperos so it was it was great. <laughs> It was not your typical, you know, 3 a.m. situation. Though I have had that before, though. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, La Fabrique à Gâteau, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And it's 
people around. Yeah, right. And you mentioned that there were two ladies that uh, worked there. So that's a, that was a bit of an unusual circumstance, wouldn't it have been, for a pastry shop in Paris? Yeah, I would say relatively unusual, um, especially because it was two friends who decided to open up this shop. And um, they'd study together at Ferrandi, which is another fantastic school in Paris for pastry, and then had worked together at a very renowned pastry shop in Paris um, for several years before deciding to go out and opening their own shop. So they were, I mean, their creations were very unique takes on classics, and they were fun. Um, a little bit wacky sometimes. There was like zebra print inside the shop. And uh, it was just, it was a great environment and uh, all in French, but absolutely fantastic. I loved it. You were at Le Cordon Bleu. That's, I mean, for so many people, they know Le Cordon Bleu through Julia Childs. What was the experience like to be there in those halls and, and rooms where people like Julia Childs have been before? It was amazing. Uh, we actually had a hallway that was dedicated to Julia Child and I loved that um, because one of the one of my favorite books just in general is My Life in France um, talking about Julia Child's life (laughs) and uh, it was just it was so amazing and um, I actually I went to the older school so they had an older location on Rue Vaugiard uh, in the 15th. And since I graduated, I actually moved to another location. It's definitely larger, more modern, and um, I'm sure it was still absolutely fabulous. Uh, but it was very different being in this tiny, tiny school with, I think, three floors um, and not enough space for the amount of students that they had. <laughs> I remember it well, yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Every time, like every week, our schedule would change uh, because they had to kind of rotate people through. But it was a really fantastic experience. I I really enjoyed it. And you're making pastry constantly. So as people, can you explain the whole sort of uh, process of how you learn at Le Cordon Bleu um, for people out there that haven't been before? Yeah, so uh, you always do a demonstration. And for that, you are sitting and watching the chef prepare either two to four desserts in one sitting. Okay, and those classes are, I think they were three hours, if I remember correctly. And um, the, the actual recipes that you received only included the ingredients and the quantities. Sometimes the oven temperatures, but that was it. And so um, you had to write down all of the instructions as you heard them from the chef. And um, I started developing a shorthand, you know, for how to write those down because there's so much information. And you really started to learn by, of course, listening to what was happening, but also watching the motions of the chef as he was going through different things. Um, So you did that first, the demonstration, and then either you would go straight into what was called practical, which was small group scenarios where you were actually making some of the desserts that the chef just demonstrated, or you would come back another day, like depending on your schedule. But that was how it went. So first a demonstration, here's exactly how it's supposed to look. Yours should look exactly like this. (laughs) And then going into the practical. And at the end, they would go through and the, the chef would go around and actually um, grade your pastries, sometimes taste them, but not always, which I thought was kind of. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, sometimes those schedules, they, they, they can be like one on top of the other. So I found, I don't know whether you were the same thing, but you know, you would come home one night, uh, and you've been, had a practical in the morning and then had to hang around for the afternoon because your session was in the evening and you're making, oh, I don't know, 12 croissants, 12 pan au chocolates, 12 brioches, and you bring all that home all at once. Um, And then the next day you're making a cake. Yep. Yep. And you've got to bring that home. My roommate loved it. (laughs) Yes. My goodness. Yes, my husband did the same. Uh, but it's not so good for the waistline. But look, that's what the, the Paris Metro and all of those uh, steps in your apartment to get to your apartment are for. Oh my gosh, exactly. 
Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Molly, then after your uh, course at Le Cordon Bleu and your stage, you then went back to Texas and um, that must have been a bit of a culture shock for you to go back home after being in Paris for, was it like a year? Yeah, it was a year and a couple of months actually. I stayed up until I had to leave. <laughs> I think there's four days left on my visa and um, I was, I knew in my heart that I wanted to come back. And so I was like, I, you know, I'm going to play by the rules, leave before my visa's up and then figure it out when I'm back home. And um, so when I moved back, I still had my marketing job. So I'd been working for them remotely while I was in Paris um, because school was 15 hours per week and I wanted to have some income coming in so I could pay for my rent, you know, go out and do things in Paris, et cetera, et cetera. But also I wasn't sure at that point if I was ready to make the full switch into pastry. And so I was like, let's hang on to this. I really love my marketing job. I'm exploring pastry. I'm not sure where that's going to go. And so when I moved back to Texas, I started doing both. So I did two days, two or three days of my marketing job, and then two days, two or three days of pastry. So kind of depending on how it went. And um, it was exhausting. So I would have a job that was very much so, you know, using like a ton of brain power, sitting at a desk, looking at Excel all day. And then I would have a job where I was standing for super long hours. And uh, I mean, as you know, and it's also very like, you know, using a lot of mental power, but a lot of physical power too. So it would be either like, I just had the worst headache, like exhausted from my day, or, you know, <laughs> my feet would be exhausted. But it was great because I was kind of in this in-between period. So I had time to really explore being in a professional kitchen and what that looked like. And if I really wanted to do that, um, because oftentimes people after they go to culinary school or even when they're in culinary school, they're like, hmm, well, this was fun, but let's do this as a hobby because it's hard. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. Um, and so I had time to, to really discover and I worked for a lot of different places while I was back in Texas. And how did you find the difference, there's that, that cultural difference, but then just in what you'd been taught in Paris for French patisserie compared to how it is made in America? I mean, one of the experiences that I know that I've had when I've gone to the States is that things seem to be a lot sweeter. And I'm always amazed by the comments of people that they say they come to a Paris patisserie and they will have something and they go, it's not as sweet as it is back home. Oh gosh, you are so right. I think that, yes, there's there's a lot of people that when they try my dessert, they do find that the sweetness levels are a lot more subtle than what they're used to. And so I think people really appreciate that. Uh, and it's also something that you can kind of dial back or dial up to. So I've had, you know, a lot of good feedback in terms of that. More subtle, focusing on really good ingredients and, um, yeah, a good balance of um, the actual components in the dessert. So it's not just a one note, ooh, this is really sweet. It's more so you're tasting, oh, the chocolate in there, plus the raspberries, plus a little bit of texture from, you know, the nuts that have been added and the and things like that, just to bring a really well-rounded um, treat. And so similarly to myself, I came to Paris in 2012 and then came back again um, in 2016. So you had that pull for France was uh, calling and and saying, you know, you need to come back. You need yeah. to come back. So what, what brought you to come back to France? Well, I, as soon as I left, well, no... <laughs> say way before I left France, I knew that I wanted to come back. And um, the funny thing is, is before that, I was never a Francophile. Uh, you know, I wasn't one of those girls that had, um, you know, Paris photos all over my room. Um, but I had really fallen in love with the city and the culture. So I left and I was actually supposed to come pretty much immediately back to France. Um, to work for a Mexican restaurant that was by two French guys that I know. And 
<laughs> just which with what is common with restaurant openings, they often get pushed back. And so it actually worked out really well um, because then I was able to work at lots more, you know, a lot more places in Dallas, really keep, you know, continuing to learn. And um, eventually I got back a year later and um, my goal I came back on a tourist visa, which means that you can come back for three months maximum. So while I was here, I was looking for a job. So I had my resume, my CV ready. I was going from place to place in Paris and <laughs> trying to find a way to stay here long term. Um, and in the middle of that, I also worked for a chateau in the south of France. Yes, I've seen that. What was that experience like? Oh, it was incredible. It was um, an amazing place to be really inspired in terms of different creations. And I was given a lot of liberty in terms of what I wanted to make. So that was great. So I was really putting to use everything that I'd learned in school, but also by working after I graduated and developing um, my kind of signature style, which takes years to really kind of grow into and, and discover. So, um, yeah, it was wonderful. And the south of France, I mean, it's such an amazing place. Uh, the ingredients, especially the the fruit and things that would come from that area, the lemons, it's, oh, I can imagine it's just an amazing uh... place for produce. <laughs> Yeah, there was a local market in the village, and so I go down uh, once a week uh, when they had it on Saturday and pick up different fruits and vegetables. But um, also, there was markets in the surrounding villages, so you could kind of go to one any day of the week uh, when you needed to pick something up or when you wanted a little bit of inspiration. You know, see it was in season, and uh, it was it was fantastic. Yeah. So I like to call you the princess of pastry. <laughs> Um, and that's because our viewers might not know, but you live in, you will, you don't live in Versailles. Well, you technically do. do. You live technically. in the city of the city of Versailles, not the, the, the Chateau of Versailles. Well, maybe you live in the Chateau of Versailles. I don't know. Um, I mean, I mean no, but <laughs> very close by. I'm five minutes walk from the castle. <laughs> but what is that like? What's that like as an experience to, I mean, Living in Paris is an experience enough. You know, there's so such sensory overload. Versailles is one of my favorite places in France. I've done tours there myself. You do tours there. What's that like to have that experience of being living so close to Versailles? It is. It's fantastic. Um, so I, it's very, very different from Paris, where I lived for um, three years, and it's. You know, it's just fabulous. So there's a lot more to the city than just the chateau. Um, I think, as you know, <laughs> a lot of people go down those main boulevards into the castle. Um, it's massive. And so you're exhausted. I went um, last week and <laughs> I was like, I spent a couple of hours there. And afterwards, I was just like, OK, ready to go home. You, you went for the dog walk I saw on Instagram. And I, I love that because it was like when I was in Paris, our dog walking park was the Palais Royale yes. and yours. Yours is the Gardens of Versailles. It is. So there's a part of the garden. Well, there's a couple of parts of the gardens that are open to everyone, right? Um, including dogs. And so um, the one that I walk around most often is called Pièce de de Suisse. Um, and it's named after the Swiss guard that actually dug out this lake. And um, it's beautiful. So it's in the shape of an 18th century mirror. So an oval shape with kind of some indentations. And um, it's to the left side of the Versailles Chateau if you're facing the front gates. And you can see a be beautiful view of the palace and the orangery. And um, that's where, I, yeah, that's where I walk my dog. <laughs> it's fabulous. Why not? Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, that's great. Have you been to Marie Antoinette's little village that she had built? Oh, it's gorgeous. So I went um, during COVID. There was a time where it was 
open to the public, the gardens. It was in between a couple of confinements. And so I went then and um, the buildings themselves were still closed, but it was fun to to walk around the, the property that she had there, the beautiful farmhouses. And there's even farm animals. And um, I'm, I need to go back here pretty soon. I'm thinking I'll go maybe next week. Um, but it's such a great area to discover. Now, getting back to macarons. Yes. You have a new book out. What's it called? It's called French Pastry Made Simple. On the cover, you have some cream puffs with some berries on top on a very beautiful antique platter. And then there's also a porcelain figurine of Marie Antoinette. And it's like she's oh, leaning on one of, of the there is. Love it. <laughs> it's are there any macaron recipes in the book? There are. There's actually a macaron tower here. So... I made it with pink and um, yellow macaron, um, and it's it's really great because it has very detailed instructions in terms of what to look for when making French macaron because they are quite difficult. They're very finicky. So getting into that, I wanted to ask you, there's for people that are listening, there's actually three different types of meringues. Is that correct? And I touched on this before with the Italian meringue being sort of the most popular, but can you explain the differences in the meringues? Yeah. So you have three, the French, Italian, and the Swiss meringues, and they're all named after countries. Don't ask me why, but <laughs> they all are. <laughs> um, the French meringue is the most simple. So you're just whipping up egg whites and adding granulated sugar to them um, until they make a stiff peak, uh, depending on what you're making. The Italian meringue is where you heat up sugar and water to make a sugar syrup, a hot sugar syrup, and you're heating it to a certain temperature and then you pour it into whipped up egg whites. Um, and so that is one of the more stable options. It's what most pastry chefs use for, um, you know, piping on top of a lemon tart or, um, you know, even baking it. So meringue kisses, things like that, icing a cake um, and making macaron. Then you have the third version, which is Swiss meringue. And it's funny because um, I don't make it a lot. Uh, I think because I find it a little bit more time intensive, if that makes sense, which is so funny. Um, but you put um, your egg whites and your sugar in a mixing bowl, and then you put that over a pot of steaming water. A bain-marie. Yes, exactly. A bain-marie, the bane of Marie's existence. <laughs> mm. I know. It's an oldie, yeah. but a goodie. It's a goodie. <laughs> You're whisking it until the sugar dissolves and the actual temperature of the egg whites, well, the mixture actually increases. Then you whip it up. So I think why I, I don't like that one as much is it is very manual in terms of your, it's very hands-on. You're whisking a lot. You're touching, you know, the sugar and the egg whites, which are sticky and hot. And then, you know, there's water involved and like it's dripping off the pot. I'm really selling it, right? Mm. That's yeah, why, I know. No. <laughs> that's why I really like Italian meringue because you just put the sugar and water in a saucepan, put a thermometer in, watch the temperature, and then pour it into your whipped up egg whites. So, and then you just whip it up until the bowl is cool. Now, what would be the biggest misconception about making a, um, a macaron from the uh, point of view of being a professional pastry chef to being a home cook? Yeah, so I think there's a couple. So you touched on one of them at the beginning. Um, a lot of people think that uh, professionals use French meringue in order to make macaron, but um, I most places use Italian meringue. Um, it's more stable. It's easier to produce great quantities of macaron. Um, so one of my jobs after I graduated was actually working on a macaron station, and I made 1,500 oh. macaron per day. And... Um, <laughs> That's what we use. Now I've seen you. I've seen you make them on Instagram, and yeah. now I know why you get the perfect shaped macaron, yeah. and I do not, because <laughs> never in my life have I made fifteen hundred macarons in a day. Never in my life will I make fifteen hundred macarons in a day. I don't think. 
Yeah. Molly, yeah. oh my gosh. It is, it's a lot of piping practice. And so it's really kind of getting the hand motion down. And yes, professionals use the Italian meringue version, but most often I teach the French meringue version. So that is actually okay. what is in my cookbook because it's easier, it's more accessible, and um, it's just overall, it is, it's easier to understand. I mean, you're just whipping up egg whites and adding sugar. Um, and so there, there's a little bit more to it. There's a little um, bit of technique involved um, when you're always making meringue, uh, which I describe in the book. There's a whole section on meringue, actually. <laughs> Specifically for macaron, it, there's, the most important thing is following the method and understanding the different hand motions that are involved, each of the steps that you kind of have to follow um, one after the other. And um, if you're following those steps in that method, it, you know whether you're using the French meringue method or the Italian meringue method for making those, you're gonna have good results. One of the most important things about a macaron is the eating <laughs> of the macaron, I have to say. What, what yes. would you say is the perfect accompaniment to a macaron? Oh, okay, well. <laughs> A lot of people um, actually like champagne with macaron, but I actually don't. Um, this is going to sound funny, but I really like a, an espresso with it. I think the the difference, in, like the the hot espresso with the macaron, which I'm going to describe the texture because a lot of people don't know it. So I've had a lot of people take my classes and be like, wait. They're chewy. Are they supposed to be chewy? And yes, they're supposed to have a little bit of a crunch on the outside and then be chewy on the center. And um, people have experienced macarons in a lot of different um, textures, right? And that really depends on how long they've been in the case at the shop, um, what the filling is, and how fresh they are. So if you're making them homemade, you get the best results every time, right? You get the best experience, I think, because they're fresh and honestly, they're so good when you make them homemade. Um, and I love them like that. So I store them in the freezer like most professionals do. Um, so that's another misconception. And I tell people to only keep them in the refrigerator for two to three days because they go stale very, very quickly. Um, so if you've ever had a macaron that was crunchy on the outside and then really, really, really soft on the inside, it's probably because they've been hanging around for a little bit too long, right? Um, and I will eat them frozen, so. <laughs> I used to have a food tour in Melbourne uh, that was a sweets tour and we went to a fabulous place called A La Folie and uh, they've actually closed down now but they, they really did, in my opinion, uh, make the best uh, macarons in Melbourne, not in Australia at the time. And um, a little tip that Mercedes, the owner there, gave me was and, and gave the many people that came on the tour, uh, if you were going home and it was interstate, you were flying interstate or even overseas and buying them, uh, well, was to pop them in the freezer and have them the next day. So, and it re refreshes them. Uh, and uh, yeah, many people used to do that. Many people used to go on the tour, have the macarons and then go to the store via on their way to the airport to pick up yep. more macarons just before they oh, left. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I live in Montmorillon. This is where uh, I'm based. You're in Versailles. And Montmorillon is known for its Montmorillon macaron. Oh, what's that? Uh, I don't know if you knew that. And um, oh. But it's interesting. It's not a macaron like you described, but it's also not a macaron like a macaroon. Mm -hmm. It looks like a macaroon, but it's actually made with almonds. So if you took the coconut out of the macaroon uh -huh. and put almond in, that's what it would be like. It's a secret recipe. I, I don't know how it came about or why it's called a macaron, but then in research, I found out that uh, there's actually many different types of macarons depending on where you live in France. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest ones is the ancien so the the old macaron which is in the bordeaux area and that is just the shells so it's what they used to be before they came to paris in the 1800s and um it's you know still what you use as your base for your french macaron now um but it's just the cookies and they actually pipe them on parchment paper 
Um, in the olden days, they piped them on newspaper. <laughs> Hopefully not a fresh newspaper. I don't know, man. <laughs> I bet you would like pick up the macaron and then read the daily news on the back. That's for sure. <laughs> But yeah, it's just the cookie has. And then in the, I think it was the 1850s, it came to Paris and La Durée decided to put a filling in between because um, the Parisians wanted something fancy. Mm. So that's what we're kind of more familiar with nowadays. Speaking of La Durée, uh, so many people's experience um, of a macaron in Paris is their wonderful store at uh, and restaurant at the Champs Elysees. What is your favorite macaron shop in Paris? Pierre Hermé, hands down, um, he does the best. Uh, so the different flavors are very unique. They're very, very well done. Um, I mean, and they just, they just do a really good job with everything. So um, definitely go for a box of mackerel. And then if you want something else, they have a vanilla tart that is made with four different kinds of vanilla. So that's kind of fun to experience as well. I'm going to Paris tomorrow for the dentist and now I need to get macarons and a vanilla tart. <laughs> and possibly an, a, an, ultra, an ultra dentist appointment. <laughs> oh, what have you just done to me, Molly? Molly, you, if I hope you don't mind me saying, your partner is a lovely Frenchman. Is that correct? Yes. So tell me, you must have the inside knowledge. What or when, I should say, when do the French eat macaron? I would say probably at tea time um, or if they're like goûter. Oh, the goûter, oui, afternoon. Yeah, so goûter for everybody is uh, French for afternoon tea. So uh, it's at it's around four o'clock when the kids come home from school, but it's just a little something sweet in the afternoon. Or they're great for gifting. So just like when, um, you know, people, tourists come in and they buy, you know, a box of La Dure macarons, they're usually bringing them home either for themselves, of course, or as a gift. And um, yes, they are often given as gifts, that's for sure. Um, or uh, for a special celebration, so a birthday, an anniversary, um, something like that, uh, you'll have, you know, a box of macaron. And they come in all different sizes, so, uh, you know, you can get lots of different flavors in one box. Um, so you can really kind of discover them all and whoever's at your gathering can pick the flavor that appeals most to them. What's your favorite flavor in a macaron? I love chocolate. So just a simple chocolate ganache. And the reason why is because the, the chocolate ganache really balances out the sweetness of the shells. So for me, that's my favorite. Um, almost, I mean, you could kind of describe it as a really, really, really fancy brownie in terms of the texture. So that slight chewiness, right, in the center and um, a lot of richness. And yeah, that's definitely my favorite. Or salted caramel, for sure. <laughs> or both. Oh, both, exactly. I wouldn't say no to any of those. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> now, when you're making a macaron, the flavor is important, but the flavor is not in the shell, is it? No. So when often I think that people see that, they see that the shell is flavored and they think that, oh, sorry, the shell's a different color. And they think that, well, you know, if it's a red color, they put raspberry in it or something along those lines. But no, tell us, how do you get flavor in a macaron? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Uh, traditionally, the flavor just comes from the filling. Um, so the shells are kind of the vehicle of bringing the flavor to you, right? With a different kind of texture there. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't play around with putting flavor in the shells. Um, so oftentimes what I tell people is to change a little bit of the almond flour for a different kind of nut. So like for example, for pistachio, I would change out 25% of the almond flour with really finely ground pistachios. Um, I've done that with pecans, uh, being from Texas, uh, I love pecans. And so I would do like a chocolate pecan version for Thanksgiving. And um, that's the easiest way to really bring flavor into the shells, but you can start messing around with it more and changing out for like graham crackers for some more option. But with that being said, um, because they are more difficult to do, I always, always, always tell people start off with just the basic shell recipe, you know, changing up the colors, however much you want, and then really play around with the fillings. 
And once you've really got those shells down, because that's the hardest part, then you can start making little tweaks here and there and maybe adding some different flavors in them. Maybe we'll have to get into making an Aussie one with some macadamia nuts or something on those sides. Mm. <laughs> I love that. With the color, do you recommend powdered coloring or gel? Is there anything that's better for a macaron? So if you have powdered food coloring, it's definitely um, what you want to use because meringue does not like liquid, um, but it also doesn't like fat. So if you've ever made a meringue, there's always those warnings, like make sure there's no egg yolk in your egg whites, right? So always use fresh egg whites that you're separating, separate them when they're cold and um, make sure you're using a clean bowl, no, you know, no fat in the bowl either. And um, when you're adding that coloring, it, um, this isn't the time to use a liquid food coloring because oftentimes you're adding so much of it to get that color to stand out that it's adding too much liquid to the meringue and that can cause cracking and all sorts of other problems. Whereas if you use a powder or a gel, gel is fine too, um, then it's a more concentrated color and you're not really messing with that um, really specific, um, you know, kind of formula for the shells there. So powdered food coloring, which can be hard to find, but uh, there's, <laughs> it's worth it, especially if you're really into making macarons. Yeah, and I think many of our listeners would be too. Molly, as I mentioned before, you do, do tours in Versailles, but you do cooking classes both online and in person. Is that right? You tell us a bit about that. Yes. So I've been doing a lot of virtual classes um, with COVID. And um, with it ending, well, I don't know, <laughs> changing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hopefully um, one day I soon. <laughs> then I'll start doing um, in-person classes here pretty soon. Um, my in-person classes are all private. So it's usually a close group of friends or a family that's coming in or just a solo baker that really wants to learn more. Okay. Um, yeah, and they're really fun. <laughs> fabulous. I'll have to come up to Versailles one day and have a class. We've been chatting. You have a fabulous meal there in Versailles. It's called the Moulin de Versailles. So Moulin means meal. And um, they use flour. So their wheat comes from uh, farms that are within, I think it's 100 kilometers of the actual mill itself. So it's very, very local. And they're using a combination of very old um, equipment with modern equipment. And um, the result is, is quite fabulous. And the bags themselves are really fun too because they're kind of a yellow gold color. There's the Sun King on there and it says, say royal, which means it's royal. <laughs> so what I need in my kitchen. Definitely. Some royal flour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Molly Wilkinson, your book is French Pastry Made Simple. Where can people buy it? It is <laughs> it's sold worldwide. So wherever book, books are sold. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So you're on the Amazon and the book depository. Exactly. And Barnes & Noble, uh, all of those. <laughs> I've always wanted to be on the Amazon. Um, Molly Wilkinson, thank you for joining us on Fabulously Delicious. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we've learned so much about yourself and about macarons. Yes. Well, hey, happy to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you. How fabulous is Molly Wilkinson? So many great tips there on making macarons, as well as such as an infectious laugh. You've got to love the princess of pastry. Molly, I hope to come and cook with you soon. Thank you so much for listening to this first episode of Fabulously Delicious. I hope you subscribed. Next week, it's all about French bread with the wonderfully fabulous Katie Quinn. I'm Andrew Pryor, and remember, as I always say, whatever you do, do it fabulously. With me, of course, here on Fabulously Delicious.